Good morning, everyone, once again. How was breakfast? Good? Very good. So I'd now like to recognize and to thank our elected officials who are in attendance this morning. Would you please stand when your name is called? Of course, beginning with the Honorable Stephen Collier, Mayor of the City of Lawrence. The Honorable Lisa Chavez, Lawrence Common Council President. The Honorable Sharon Freeman, Lawrence Common Councilor, District 3. There's Sharon. The Honorable Elizabeth Wheeler, Lawrence Common Councilor, District 6. I don't see Elizabeth. The Honorable Tyrell Giles, Lawrence Common Counselor, District 1. The Honorable Tom Chevlat, Lawrence Common Counselor, District 5. There's Tom. Good morning. The Honorable Bob Jones, Lawrence Common Counselor at Large. The Honorable Kathy Walton, Lawrence City Clerk. Thank you. Mr. Reginald McGregor, Lawrence Township School Board President. <laughs> Mr. Richard Frege, Lawrence Township School Board Vice President. <laughs> Ms. Wendy Muston, Lawrence Township School Board Secretary. <laughs> Mr. Sean Denny, Lawrence Township School Board Member. And Ms. Carol Helmus, Lawrence Township School Board member. Thank you all for your attendance this morning and for your leadership. I'd also like to recognize and to thank our Lawrence Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors who are in attendance this morning. Beginning with our chairman of the board, Mr. Fred Dufour. Uh, Fred, due to his scheduling conflict last minute, is unable to attend, but certainly here in spirit, and wanted to pass on his regards. And of course, Fred rep represents Monarch Beverage. Our first vice chair, Ms. Kim Matthews, owner of Associated Insurance Services. Our second vice chair, Ms. Vidian Robinson, owner of Vidian's Upholstery, Reupholstery. And I think everyone in the room knows Vidian is the official social butterfly of the organization. <laughs> Our board treasurer, Mr. David Deaton of First Financial Bank. <laughs> board member, Ms. Cassandra Ferrote, owner of Total Rewards Solutions. <laughs> board member, Mr. John Walski, owner of Ski Landscaping. Board member Stefan Kirk, Stephen Kirk, pardon me, owner of Kirk Law Firm. And at the risk of embarrassing her terribly, I do want to introduce our executive coordinator, Ms. Angela Taylor, whom you met at the front desk. She helped to organize this event, so big thank you to, uh, to Angela. So thank you all for your attendance and your support. I'd also like to extend our thanks to the various community leaders, dignitaries, members of the media, and special guests who have joined us this morning. Thank you all. Now to introduce our featured speaker, would you please welcome Mr. Andy Brown of Gregory and Appel Insurance. It's truly an honor to be here today, this historic and vibrant community. I see many friends here and uh, just met some new friends uh, and hopefully many more. And, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, uh, the city administration. And, and, you know, what has struck me is the passion that uh, Mayor Collier's uh, uh, administration has in serving the community. And again, once again, it's just an honor to be here with so many friends. With that being said, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Mayor Steve Collier for his uh, State of the City Address.
people don't know me very well. They keep calling, putting honorable in front of my name, and they have to know me a little bit better in there. Uh, Mel, you're the only guy I know that could find something good to say about today's weather in there. But uh, as Bill said, uh, it's the Lord's work, so I'll forgive you for that in there. Um, I also want to make sure before we omit, uh, Mike McClellan, uh, city councilor, is here, and I think he got omitted, and I think he came late in there, so Mike McClellan here is city council. Stand up, Mike. Yeah, everybody else did. Before I start, I want to make sure and recognize uh, a couple of young uh, men who work with me because what you're about to see here is a presentation and I'm kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the co-star today because uh, Jimmy Griffin and Max Butler have done a great job of putting together information that will make it much easier for you to follow what I'm about to go through today. I got to get started because Trey says 30 minutes only and uh, I got a lot to say today, which is a good thing. So let me start. First of all, I want to welcome each of you uh, that came today. Certainly, uh, you show such support for the city by coming in, even on a rough day like this, uh, and filling this room, uh, that you, obviously you care a lot about the city, and that's great to be able to have that uh, situation that's happening here today. Um, I've set some aggressive goals for the first two years of this administration. Moving Lawrence forward has been a truly rewarding and challenging task. I knew it would be. I am encouraged each and every day by the support and positive feedback I receive from our citizens, business leaders, great schools, churches, civic organizations, members of our military, and those who serve with me in local government. Perhaps my single greatest frustration, and those of you who know me know this, is the sluggish pace at which progressive and innovative ideas can be integrated and put into place. The only place slower than municipal government is state government, and the only place slower than state government is federal government. Uh, so it's frustrating, but you got to keep at it. I'm committed to sharing my progressive vision with as many groups and individuals as I can. A common challenge that cities like Lawrence encounter is in educating its citizens. That cities like Lawrence encounter, and in, in, encounter in, in, what you have to do to grow your city. As I continue to build relationships with mayors around me and cities around me, I'm comforted by the fact that they also encounter the same types of issues and problems that I do. And we all are committed as mayors of cities just like Lawrence to doing whatever we can to make things happen and make sure that we include our, our city and our constituents. I am consistently and daily awed by the dedication of the talented people who've joined me in this endeavor. I believe that I've assembled the most skilled and capable staff of any city our size before I get too far into this, I want to introduce my, my administration. You've already heard Kathy Walton. Again, I say it every year, the most well-known and well-liked person in, in Lawrence right now, but uh, so I hang out with her a lot. Uh, Jason Fenwick and Jason Street are my, my controllers. David Hoffman and Dino Batalis, police chief and fire chief. Department of Public Works, Bill Anthony and David Lotz. Parks director and I think possibly the longest serving employee in the city of Lawrence or close to it, Eric Martin. Economic Development Director Cam Starnes. Utility Superintendent Scott Salisbury. Many of you got to see Scott on television a lot early this year. Scott and I had to apply for our Screen Actors Guild's card in order to be able to uh, continue to be on, on, on the uh, television. Human Resources Director Dean Steen, Stearns, Steens. Sorry, Danita. <laughs> Public Information Officer Jimmy Griffin, Corporate Counsel David Johnson, IT Coordinator Stephen Clark, and of course, nothing could happen in the city without these two ladies, Julie Cocola and Mary Jo Rothenbush, Administrative Assistants. It's also nice for me to see members of the council here today, Lisa, Terrell, Tom, Sharon, Elizabeth, Bobby, thanks for coming today. Appreciate you guys being here. Throughout 2017, we dedicated ourselves to putting processes in place to run the city more efficiently and improve access to our citizens. As I outline our accomplishments in these first two years and define our shared vision, I believe you will see that common thread. Every one of my department has leads of staff dedicated uh, individuals who have been given this simple directive. Do whatever it takes to provide the necessary services to our 47,000 constituents each and every day. We have closed the books in 2017 with some very good news. 
the city ended the fiscal year with a general fund operating reserve that has more than doubled in just two years. And I'll repeat that. Our operating reserve has more than doubled in just two years. This rainy day reserve is vital in, for planning emergencies and mitigating unexpected changes in revenue. With this reserve, the city has reached a level of financial stability that we fully expect will result in our third S&P upgrade in as many years. I'll repeat that. We expect to get our third S&P upgrade in as many years. Finally, after years of stagnation, we can begin to invest in capital projects. Last year at this same venue, I told you that we had set an aggressive target of establishing an operating reserve of 10% of budgeted expenditures. We thought that was pretty aggressive, but nonetheless, we set the, we set the target for ourselves. Today, I can tell you that we blew that goal out of the water. We got to 17% of operating reserves, or $3.5 million in operating reserves for the city. This is a critical benchmark for fiscal, fiscal responsibility, and I'm exceedingly proud of this feat for our city. Jason and I have now reset our minimum general fund operating reserve, driving my employees nuts, by the way, to target to 20%, or just over $4 million out of budget expenditures by December of this year. Now, as a comparison, only five years ago, our total operating reserve was about $60,000. What does that mean for us? It means that our ability to now begin to invest and to actually integrate and begin capital projects is far greater. The reputation fiscally of the city now with agencies like S&P and other bond banks has improved dramatically. So we can now, as I said earlier, we can now begin to really legit, legitimately think about investing in some major capital projects in the city. I'll mention this now, but I'll mention it later on again. One of those first big ones we're going to end up doing is the police station. It'll be, it'll be big for the city. We've talked about it, of course, ad nauseum. That'll be the first big project that we'll do in the city, and the first one in several years. I'll now go to each different department. From the controller's office, I've already talked about this in a little bit, so I'll make this head a little bit bigger here. But once again, we increased spending on public safety. We replaced squad cars, battalion vehicles, and ambulances. We continued to, I'll get that. That's an old, that's an old Jerry Seinfeld joke, by the way. He does it better than I do. We will continue to prioritize technology and move the city forward with investment in this area. The city has fully migrated its information to a hosted, a hosted cloud environment with multiple layers of backups and redundancies. We never have to worry again about being in a position where we might lose data because every single day the events and the finance of the city are backed up every single day. So that makes us feel very, very good about that. In April of 2017, the city was upgraded by S&P to A+. Now, I'm a school teacher. So for school teachers, A plus is the best grade you can get. But apparently not with S and P. You can go all the way to triple A plus. So we have some room to improve. But I know in my classroom, and Kenny and Sean and Vest, you guys in the background, you know this. A plus was a top grade. So I'm not sure where we're going from here, but we'll try to get there. For the first time. In the city's history, we received the Government Finance Officer's Distinguished Budget Award. That is the highest award that you can win in Indiana for budget preparation. Only two other cities in the state got that award. I won't name them, but it's Fishers and South Bend. <laughs> in November, Lawrence's own Jason Fenwick was honored by the Indiana Business Journal as a finalist for its CFO of the Year Award. This is a big one. Just found out two weeks ago, Lawrence became the only city in the nation, the only city in the nation to be awarded the 2018 Tyler Public Sector Award for Efficiency in Government, demonstrating savings of nearly $250,000 in increased IT efficiencies. It's tough to save money in IT, trust me. It's tough to save money in IT. 
almost a quarter million dollars in efficiency to accomplish with Tyler in there. In December, the city would, in, city would end of the year with 124% increase since 2015 in operating reserves, totaling just over $3.5 million. We're controlling spending, yet moving Lawrence forward with intentional investments for all of the citizens. Economic development. CAM has continued to develop a relationship with businesses in and around the city of Lawrence daily. I get comments from business leaders around Lawrence at how much and how educated and how helpful CAM has been in helping citizens come to the city. Our joint marketing strategy with Lawrence Township Schools brought us the market, brought us marketing campaign, great city, great people, great people, great schools. You'll see that on billboards throughout the city. We've seen Val Plus Meter open its doors, along with Arts to Remember, new corporate headquarters, Jack's Donuts, the Pancake Emporium, Futai, Fitzgerald's have opened, and Tim Hortons will soon be a welcome addition to our community. All of you know what Tim Hortons is? <laughs> kind of like the McDonald's of Canada. So Tim Hortons is going to open up a second one here on the, on the northeast side here. The Bradley Company has purchased and begun a major remodel of the Harrison Building to host a Department of Child Services. Otis Avenue to Lee Road opened in July, paving the way for the partial day development that will include a Marion County Library. Planning and development at the corner of 59th and Sunnyside for Meyer Plastics continues. By effectively leveraging EPA grant dollars into private investment along the Pendleton Pike Corridor, we continue to enhance our proposal for a trades district. Dan Pell has purchased and continues to upgrade Maison Gardens at 42nd and Post. The city partnered with Chris Barnett to complete quiet title searches. These re resulted in two Habitat for, for Humanity homes being completed and transferred in 2017. We've got one more plan for 2018 so far. Facilitation of continued tech investment and innovation with businesses such as Blue Ribbon Transport, Bloomerang, Perceivant, MMY Consulting, Springboard Marketing, and most recently Val Plus Media are expanding our tech base. In partnership with Trace Yates and the Lawrence Chamber of Commerce and McKenzie Career Center for Innovation and Technology, CAM and Trace are putting together a Tech, Trades, and Innovation Symposium that will highlight Lawrence and explore how to support and advance those industries for the benefit of Lawrence and all of Central Indiana. Our utilities. I would like to be able to show you where Scott started in January 2016 to where Scott is today. I have said this too many times for him, I'm sure, but it's too bad that Scott was a superintendent of the Lawrence Utilities 12 years ago, because what's happened in the last two years is nothing short of amazing. In May of 2017, the Common Council followed the recommendation of the Utility Services Board with my full support, adopted new rates for the water utility. This resulted in a financially solvent water utility. That was a brave move on the part of the Common Council. Nobody likes to see rates increase. We all knew that. But the Common Council stepped up along with USB to raise rates, and we now see a water utility that's in a far healthier position. The Sumac water main replacement project is complete with a 1,000-foot water main. It had an acceptably high failure rate in the past, I believe something like 11 or 12 breaks in a little over two years on 1001. Yeah. The new Richart water plant, if you haven't driven by it, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an impressive facility. Construction is well underway, and, it, and when it's done, it will be able to produce 4.32 million gallons of water per day. That's enough water for the entire city at one water plant. Two additional water plants are in line for major capital improvements during the second round of capital projects contained in our preliminary engineering report. Folks, if you live or you have friends in the city of Indianapolis, and we happen to have a drought this year, and you hear about Indianapolis going on restricted water, don't water your yards. And if they ask you why you're able to go ahead and water your yard and say, I live in the city of Lawrence, we got tons of water. We sit on top of the largest aquifer in, in Indiana, one of the largest aquifers in Indiana, and because of the work done by Scott and his staff, we're, we're going to be in good shape for the, the, the distant future. Scott and his team are aggressively pursuing the engineering and instruction of sanitary sewer infrastructure improvements to meet the obligation of 2009 EPA agreed order. They say that you should do about 1% of your sewer replacement every year. 
to just to maintain. We went through nearly 13 years of very little main replacement. So we have some catching up to do. The good news is we're well on our way to being able to catch up and move forward in that. This past summer, city officials, myself, Jason, David Johnson, and Scott, all went up to Chicago and met with officials from Standard & Poor. We were there to sell the city on what we, steps we had taken to make our utility and put it in better shape. The utility, the water utility had been reduced to junk bond status two years prior, three years prior, I'm sorry. So it was our job to go up there and to present our case as to what things we'd done and see if they would look kindly upon us and perhaps give us a, a better rating. Best case scenario, we were hoping for a year from that point. Apparently we did a pretty good job because only two months later, S&P raised our rating to triple B positive outlook, which got us back into investment grade. What did that mean? It meant that we could go back and refinance two bonds, refund two bonds, that would eventually save the utility over two and a half million dollars for life of bonds, money that can be in <clears throat> that'll go right back into the utility. After a decade of neglect and mismanagement, our utility is financially on very solid ground. Due to improved water utilities, financial condition expects to repay the one and a half million dollars loan that sewer made to water in full this year. We have already paid back in less than six months over $650,000 of that million and a half dollar loan. We'll have it paid back by early this summer. That means both water and utility will be in, in ground. And trust me, you'll be seeing a lot of work from the utility on both sewer and water in the next, in the next few years. Public safety. Most of you know that this is kind of the area that I have the most interest in and certainly now the most faith in. Thanks to the work of Police Chief David Hoffman and Fire Chief Dino Vitalis, we have made some game-changing advances in public safety. The integrated body-worn and in-car digital camera system has placed LPD at the forefront in utilizing this game-changing technology. A project dedicated to building trust, accountability, and community relations and full transparency resulted in LPD winning Amazon's 2017 City on a Cloud Innovation Challenge. Deputy Chief Gary. <laughs> Deputy Chief Gary Woodruff accepted the honor in, for LPD in Washington, D.C. On, on a national stage. By the fall of 2017, we brought 12 new vehicles to patrol officers while upgrading our fleet. We'll add 10 more in 2018. LPD has increased staffing in our investigations division to improve response time in this sensitive area. LPD has added 10 reserve officers. LPD now has six officers that are graduates from the IMPD Leadership Academy. The police force now boasts three newly trained arson and fire investigators. LPD continued 100% success rates in 2017 SWAT callouts and no injuries to officers or suspects in all criminal apprehensions. Chief Hoffman can report that the 911 Communications Center is now fully staffed for the first time since 2012. This is another example of improving quality service while remaining fiscally responsible for the budget. Under the guidance, I'm not done yet, under the guidance of many full-time and reserve police officers, advisors, command staff members, the LPD Explorer program continues to thrive, growing from just two young men in 2016 to 35 police explorers in 2018. Post 160 continues as the oldest continually operating post in Indiana, and now we're the largest. Thanks to the commitment of our, police, of our reserve officers and Keith Matthews as commander, they provided over more than 3,500 hours of law enforcement services to the city. This is the equivalent of having eight paid full-time officers. Friends of Lawrence Police Foundation has now built a $30,000 nest egg and has secured their 501c3 status. They get the things that the police need and perhaps the city can't pay for. <clears throat> In 2017, LPD launched its police officer support team providing a well-trained and professional peer support presence during the funerals of IMPD Chief James Walters, Waters Southport Officer Lieutenant Aaron Allen, and of course, most recently, following the tragic death of Boone County Deputy Jacob Pickett. You all know that that will take place, the funeral will take place early, later on this morning, and we'll certainly have a presence there. As is clear, Chief Hoffman has established a standard of excellence in connecting with our community. 
Just this Tuesday, we began our Citizens Police Academy with 32 participants. Headed by Deputy Chief Curtis Bigsby, who's back in the corner back there, we introduced the entire command staff to this new class of constituents who truly want to be involved, and we look forward to our graduating class this May. I threw some numbers out, I'm going to repeat them real quickly. 35 explorers, 32 reserve officers, 32 members of the police academy. That's nearly 100 people that volunteer their time on a daily basis to help our public safety and our police. That's a pretty amazing statistic to talk about the city of Lawrence and how important it is to them. That deserves an applause. Our fire department continues to serve, protect, and support our city under Chief Vitalis' leadership. LFDs put new battalion vehicles and two new ambulances into service just this past year. A new engine was put into place in January of 2017, and new ladder was put in service in April. New air packs were provided for all of our firefighters. LFD continues to provide the smoke fire alarms for all of our constituents. I've actually gone out with our firefighters, and the only trouble was they put me to work, and I had to put a couple up to provide proper replacement for installation to our homes. And it's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's really kind of a cool experience to go into nearing homes. You just kind of show up. They don't know what you're there for. And I'm sure if our fire, if I didn't have firefighters with me, they'd probably turn me away. But we put up, on the day that I worked, we put up nearly you know, 12 smoke alarms in houses that didn't have them. We didn't work fire, fire, smoke alarms in there. So it's, a, it's kind of a great thing to do. LFD continues to be a dynamic partner with uh, school district, continuously providing safety education to their students. Upgrades and improvements in our firehouse are, are ongoing as LFD purchases and installs two new generators. LFD added EMS duty officers to help with the functioning and training of our EMS personnel. We are cautiously planning on major remodeling upgrade to Station 38. We'll have to see what the remainder of 2018 brings, but barring any major litigation outcomes, this should happen in 2019. I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you that we're operating with effective and fair contracts between the city and local 416 and FOP 159. These two contracts are effective through 2020 and represent the first agreements for our public safety personnel since 2010. Be sure you join us this year for the Community Safety Day, August 11th. It's a great opportunity to see our public safety personnel conducting demonstrations. As added incentive, we have moved, winging it with our first responders to Community Safety Day. It's an idea that started out as just kind of a, basically kind of a gem, a, a, a germ of an idea. We began to go back and forth about what we would do with it. The first year we had it, we thought we might have 50 people show up. We had 200 show up. This past year, we moved it to Community Safety Day because we got rained out on July 4th. Had nearly 400 people there watching the competition between firefighters and the police with the two chiefs anchoring and eating chicken wings that I hear are a little bit hot, but I don't think they're that hot, are they, in there? So, But if you, don't, if you get a chance to see anything come out on... <laughs> On Community Safety Day, uh, it's one to one right now. We'll see what happens. Who's going to be two to one going into the the fourth year? Uh, but it's it's fun to watch. DPW. The city completed a comprehensive streets and roads asset management plan in 2016. This plan is updated each year and provides an independent needs-based roadmap for paving projects. With the help of a $301,000 match from the Community Crossroads grant. The city is committed to over $700,000 toward paving projects in 2018. We will complete four more in 2018. This will bring the total amount of money spent in pa on paving in the city to nearly $3 million. And yes, I know the potholes are bad this year. Uh, we're going to get it fixed. Uh, David's crews have filled nearly 7,000 potholes in 2017. They filled 4,000 so far in 2018, and that's a pretty amazing number of potholes filled at this time of the year. Because this time of year, you normally don't have your hot mix ready. It's not warm enough yet. Uh, but we've been out there working virtually every day for the past three, uh, well, last three weeks for sure. The only good news is, is that Mayor Hogsett's getting it tougher than not what I am out there. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Dave and Bill, for taking care of that for me in there. Two new 2,500 uh, Chevy pickups will be uh, were added. An additional salt dump truck was added in 2017 with another new salt truck in 2018. Rebuilding of our equipment, three new John Deere zero-turn mowers, one, ton, one three ton asphalt roller, brine spraying equipment. That brine we're now using allows us to treat the roads um, at least up to 48 hours in advance. People often ask me why are Lawrence's roads so much better than the other roads in Indianapolis. I won't mention any names. Uh, but the reality is, is that we're ahead of the game most of the time. I've got good people running, and we get out there early and often. 
uh, one day earlier this year, uh, there was ice coming in. Uh, I'd got the warning early. I talked with David and Bill. We even were discussing at that point whether or not we should, we should expect uh, city, uh, city workers to come in on that day. I was up at 2 a.m. David was up at 1 a.m. waiting for the call out. We got out in the roads at 2.30 that morning and Lawrence had virtually no problems. If you remember a few, a few weeks back, that was the day that Indianapolis had their, ter their terrific problems with ice in there. We were out on our roads. We had no problem in the city of Lawrence. That's all due to David's forward thinking and the help of the utility uh, drivers and DPW drivers in there. Our most recent memorandum <coughs> from Indianapolis outlined six stormwater projects, over $7.5 million planned construction to begin as early as May of 2018. A proposed run will start in the summer of 2018 with one point with a little over a million dollars. Lawrence Trades District drainage improvements will start spring of 2019 with about $880,000. 47th and Richard neighborhood drainage improvements start in late 2019, $3.4 million. That's over $7 million that will be spent in stormwater and drainage improvements in the next three years. 56th Street sidewalk will finally be uh, completed, linking up Boy Scout Road uh, with Franklin Road. The bicycle pedestrian master plan, this is one of those where we put out a, a, a essentially we put out a, a, a poll and we had, I believe, se over 700 people that replied uh, about our pedestrian and, 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 uh, and, and bike pass and walking pass. Uh, that'll be, uh, we'll have a, a meeting coming up here shortly, uh, I, th I believe it's next week, and we'll figure out where we're going to put our new bike pass and paths. We're dedicating about a million dollars to be spent on that in 2019, and we'll move on from there. We issued $834,000 in permit and building inspections. Most of you will love to hear this. Citywide streetlight improvements. We have dedicated and budgeted $133,000 over the next three years to try to fix all of our streetlights. That's in conjunction with the Palco and Fred Mills. So we're hoping to be able to do that within, certainly we'll see major improvement by the end of this summer, and we'll see perhaps dramatic improvement uh, by the end of the year. We spent nearly $15,000 in sidewalk repair in 2017. We have budgeted $40,000 in 2018. In an effort to be more responsive, we have created an easy to use form on the city website to report issues. So please use that website, cityoflawrence.org. Parks. Eric Martin amazes me every day he comes to work on how well he has that ship running. It's, uh, it runs essentially seamlessly. Once again, we've been able to increase funding for parks. Parks went through a number of years where they had no increase in funding or their other funding was decreased. We can now say that in the last couple of years, since 2015, we've increased parks funding nearly a half million dollars. Soon spring fling, we'll have nearly 200 children and over 10,000 eggs will be collected in less than 15 minutes at community park. It's fun. Uh, to watch that many kids go out and collect that many eggs in literally 15 minutes over there. Couldn't do it without Eric's planning and, of course, the help of a group of, of uh, seniors who help every year with that project. OYO, Fall Creek, and Community Parks will soon begin league play. Eric and Judy Byron are partnering to continue the weekends at the fort, Arts for Lords, Redevelopment and Parks Department, Fridays at the fort, Theater at the fort, various bands and performances, and sporting events throughout the spring and summer seasons. July 4th, I'll be back. A carnival from July, June 28th to July 5th. If you've never seen Lawrence's 4th of July fireworks, it doesn't get any better. One of the few fireworks displays in which you're actually ready for them to be over with when they're done. So it's 45 minutes. There. There'll be several free community events. Community Safety Day, Fall Festival in October, and Lawrence Christmas in November. If you had a chance to see that, my department heads were all challenged two years ago to come up with floats. And if you haven't seen the floats they come up with, they're pretty amazing in there. Uh, it's quite a competition. We continue to see increased participation in adult dance, nearly 200 uh, people that are participating in dance uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, we're, creating, we're building a new peace park and community park. You probably noticed, perhaps, if you drove by Starrett Center, the outside painting that was done this past fall. We're, in the, we're starting an interior renovation that should be done sometime this spring. We've put new play equipment at Veterans Park. 
The Fort Bend Farmer's Market will be back for its second year of operation. Locally grown fruits, vegetables, crafts, baked goods, and meats will be available. Usually a couple of food trucks there. If you haven't ever been to Pie, it's actually a giant truck that cooks pizzas in it. Uh, be there. And then this just in, this just happened last week, we will host our first ever Oktoberfest in September. Plans include 15 to 20 craft breweries, food trucks, and plenty of fun and games. So we'll have our first ever Oktoberfest here in the city. And I notice, I look back at that my firefighters are all, all of a sudden, an awful lot happier. <laughs> So Chief Hoffman may be more reserved that day. <laughs> there. Blue Star Banner. Mary Jo came into this completely unawares of what a big task it was. And Mary Jo has taken this and just expanded it and done just a tremendous job with it. The generation of our sponsors in 2017 enabled 10 of our service members to have new or replacement banners placed throughout the city. In addition, those families are able to gather at the garrison every November to start an annual Blue Star Banner Family Appreciation Dinner with members of every branch of the military to honor their continued sacrifices. We honor birthdays of our, of our armed services. Each birthday we go outside. Uh, we actually have uh, a young lady that performs the national anthem. Uh, we sometimes are able to play their, uh, uh, the each service branch's uh, uh, theme song, uh, but it's a great thing. Every, each time, and I believe we have uh, six of them, I think we did this past year. We're looking forward to the addition of the Blue Star Banner booth at the Community Safety Day this year, so look for it. Also, Mary Jo says, go to Facebook and give her a like, you know, on Facebook for the Blue Star Banner series in there. The Mayor's Action Line, Mary Jo and Julie have answered answer 13,000 calls annually. One of our, my, my main priorities is to try to make sure that we answer and respond to citizens whenever we can. Our website, if you haven't been to it, uh, we were able to roll it out uh, last summer, uh, fully roll it out. And it's become so much easier to navigate. If you haven't been there, go there. Uh, it can answer about any question you want to have out there. Uh, we don't want to tell you don't ever call the city, but sometimes your answers can be taken care of right there on that website. So look at it, we've had several people that have called us wanting to know what we did, how we did it, and how we rolled it out, but it was really the help of Jimmy and Julie and certainly our website designer that made that happen. So I'm very proud of that website over there. What to look for in 2018. As we continue to progress toward the construction of a police station in 5500 Post Road, or what is it again, Chief? Is it 5350 I'm supposed to say? 5150. 5150, because it's the title of an album who is the, who is the, Van Halen, Van Halen. yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know if it's officially 5150, but Van Halen's gonna have a road on there. We will begin to see continued interest in the needed investment and development in this part of our city. I can't stress that enough. It's not just a police headquarters that we're building. It is investing in a part of the city that badly needs uh, some attention. And how many of you are familiar with the Snafu Lounge? <laughs> Get a picture of it, because it's gonna be, <laughs> I'm not, but, uh, and those of you who have obviously just driven by it, uh, get a picture, it won't be there much longer, hopefully. We will continue to our commitment to aggressively market the city with an eye towards quality economic development. Plans are in place to establish a trades district along the Pendleton Pike Corridor. This will require a public-private partnership with private investors and public incentives. Why things like this are so important to me that I have people from the community in here understand how important you are to the growth of the city. I read this slow. Last year, there were 70 new homes built in the city of Lawrence. In 2018, we know that 70, at least 70 more will, will be built in the city. Engineering, engineering firms and developers have already sought out information from our utility about two large commercial developments up to 510 new homes. Marketing is paying off the city. This administration will continue to manage the city's finances in a responsible manner and improve constituent services. Through intelligent and thoughtful oversight, we have rebuilt the city's financial reputation. I have to say this now, because all of those things I just went through, I have to keep reminding myself that we're doing all of these things, spending quite a bit of money, and yet we are building our reserves each and every year. That's a pretty amazing feat. You can, it's easy to spend money, 
But it's not easy to spend money and save money at the same time. And the city has done that under the leadership of the, of the controller's office, Jason and Jason. <laughs> Capital projects need to become a high priority. Consolidating outdated city owned buildings, creating efficiencies and conserving energy in the process are a part of my vision. Hopefully I'll be able to expand on that this same time next year. I remain committed to the goal of celebrating the diverse population of Lawrence by providing a variety of the city sponsored and supported events. I've done some research on this. Lawrence is a city of 48,000 people. If you go throughout the state of Indiana and you look at other cities of like size of Lawrence, what you don't find in those cities is the kind of diversity that we have here in the city of Lawrence. We are the benchmark for all of Indiana, for a city of our size, exhibiting and demonstrating and celebrating the diversity that we have in the city of Lawrence. We do that not only in the city, we do that within our schools too. As I close, I want to take this final opportunity to thank all of you present today for making yourself a part of the city of Lawrence. I'd like to take just a moment, and this is the selfish part of it, to highlight a few of our citizens who are going above and beyond and who help define what makes Lawrence a great city. This morning was kind of like old home day for me. So I got looked out and I saw one of my former colleagues who I sort of grew up teaching with. She's gone to bigger and better things. And I guess you could say I have too. But Sean Ken Browner and his wife, Sean Wright Browner, have been Lawrence residents for well over 20 years. Both started their careers in education in Lawrence Township. Both have distinguished themselves in the field of education. Sean currently serves as the director of J. Everett Light Career Center in Washington Township. Ken currently serves as head coach at, head coach at Carmel High School where his teams have won the last three state championships. Sean has Washington Township at the forefront of a workforce development initiative working side by side with the McKenzie Career Center, and she was recently figured, featured on local news. Ken and Sean recently decided to move into their second Lawrence home right here in Lawrence Village. Sean, stand up back there. Karina Marino, born in Matamoros, Mexico, she served six years in the U.S. Army Reserve and became a United States citizen in 1996. She has lived in our city for the last 20 years. And for, that, for the past 11 years, she served as park manager for Coram Homes. Karina and her husband are the proud parents of two daughters and just sent their youngest off to college this past year. Their oldest daughter followed in her mother's footsteps and is currently serving her nation in the United States Air Force. Karina, if you'll stand, please. Finally, John and Amy Potter. After spending 35 years in Oregon, running their own business, the Potters determined to move to Lawrence to be closer to family. That's a statement right there. They moved from Oregon back to Lawrence. I haven't asked them why yet, but I don't really care. <laughs> Although family may have brought them to our city, it was their entrepreneurial spirit that convinced them to invest in Lawrence. In 2014, John and Amy purchased the Brigadier Apartment Complex. They are hands-on owners, the staff of three, John, Amy, and a maintenance man. They're uns I'm not sure whether, what, what, what do you do then? If you, if you, a maintenance man, what do you two do? <laughs> they are hands-on owners with a start of three, with a staff of three. There's unselfish willingness to invest the majority of their proceeds back into the apartments. Has not only resulted in a greatly improved complex, but they've improved the city of Lawrence. One of their favorite pastimes is to attend performances at the Theater of the Fort. Now, why did I do that? And I have worked on this for quite a while, but I thought to myself, we always reach out and we try to get citizens involved in the city. And I wanted to make sure that everybody here heard, these are just three of thousands of stories of citizens of Lawrence who contribute and give back to the city each and every day. I am encouraged each day by the new standard of growth and opportunity for our city, but this must include a commitment by not just those who work with me, but many of you who are directly involved in the commerce and economic development of our city. I am asking each of you in this room to commit to higher expectations and greater efforts to grow your business. Be willing to give back to Lawrence and demand that we welcome the kind of city we all know we can be. I am encouraged by how often I am told by local media that things seem to be really taking off here in Lawrence. There's a buzz. I like hearing that. 
Many of you in this room are part of what makes, is making this happen. We can and certainly should celebrate what together we have accomplished this past year. But some of you already know this about me. I can be a bit impatient. And real progress is never as easy nor as fast as we would like for it to be. But I promise you that with your help, my team will take the next step forward in continuing to drive the city to even greater heights. I'll say it one more time. We are a great city with great schools and great people. Together, let's take that next step. Thank you. I already went longer than I was supposed to, so. Uh, Trace, I'll turn it back over to you now, so. Well, is this a great community or what? Mayor Collier, thank you. Well, we learned a lot. I learned a lot. This is indeed a great community, and uh, it is reflected with the turnout that we have in the room this morning. So uh, it's nice to see everyone here. Uh, I learned that Chief Hoffman is a big Van Halen fan, apparently. That's awesome. <laughs> And perhaps Eric Martin, once upon a time, spent too much time at the snafu. I don't know. <laughs> but we love him just the same. <laughs> so I would like to extend, extend our thanks to the various community leaders, dignitaries, uh, special guests who have joined us this morning. Uh, it is wonderful for you all to be here. On behalf of the Greater Lawrence Chamber, thank you, Mayor Collier, for sharing your vision with, this, uh, with us this morning. And your vision for this community. As we depart for the day, a few final words of thanks. I would like to offer a round of applause to the folks at the Garrison and their staff for hosting us this morning. Thank you to today's volunteers and our chamber ambassadors for lending a hand. Thank you again to the City of Lawrence and today's sponsors. I certainly would like to thank our chamber membership and special guests visiting our community this morning. We hope that you return, come visit us often. And by the way, Cam, this is a wonderful place to invest, <laughs> wouldn't you say? So please come see us more often. Uh, uh, a selfish plug here, our chamber website has, uh, is new and improved since the last gathering of this event. Uh, and it's rapidly becoming a, an extension and a hub of resource for not only chamber events, but also community events. So please visit our Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce website and uh, register for any upcoming events. And in closing, it has been my honor to be here with you this morning. I look forward to our next visit. Thank you all very much and have a productive day.